Hi, good to be back here. Uh, good to see some faces in the audience that I recognized from last year. Um, my name is Elena Kolevska, and uh, this slide is already a little bit out, out, outdated. As from four weeks ago, I joined uh, Redis Lab as a technical enablement architect. Hashtag dream job. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's what you get when you come back enough times to speak at Redis Day. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about bloom filters in Redis. While I was preparing this talk, um, I wanted to set up a nice story, create suspension, and then bring up bloom filters and some kind of metaphorical, magical unicorn of the tech world. But with a name like that, I mean, it was really a spoiler. I kind of blew that for me. So what we're going to do now, we're going to just talk about an ordinary imaginary company with a relatively common use case. Let's say we're a tech company uh, that works with uh, domain registration. So we get a lot of requests in the thousands per second from our users checking if a domain name is free. Some, some are users from the website, maybe through the API, uh, maybe even some scrapers. And what would be, how would we solve this problem technically? The naive way would be to store everything in a relational database, yeah. And then we go and hit the database every time we want to check if a, rec if a domain is registered with us or not. But that would, wouldn't really be a very smart solution, yeah? Pinging the database would be really expensive. A better solution would be to maybe put everything in a set. And then every time we want to check the set, we go uh, and um, run as is member for test for membership. And with that, we would get better performance, O1 complexity, right? So, uh, and much higher speed. But then the more domains we add to our system, our memory we grow, will grow. Is it better if I stand here or here? Doesn't matter? Okay. Our memory, memory will grow. What if I told you that there is a way to do this, to scale this, so a very me uh, memory efficient, very fast, and very predictably scalable, scalable way to do this? In 1970, a mysterious computer scientist named Burton Howard Bloom presented a paper about a probabilistic data structure that would later become known as the Bloom filters. This man was so mysterious that none of you here realize this is not him. This is Howard Burton Bloom, a book author. Burton Howard Bloom, the computer scientist, is a man I'm pretty sure no one in this room ever seen, uh, saw a photo of him. Maybe the bigger part of this planet never saw a photo of him. I tried to fix that for us today, but the internet didn't provide. So what are bloom filters and what are they good for? They answer a very simple question. Is this element present in my set? The obvious answer here, yes or no. If the bloom filter says no, we can trust it. That element is definitely not present in the set. But if it says yes, hmm, the emojis don't show. <laughs> okay. Um, we, sh you know, we really cannot trust um, the positive responses. So with bloom filters, you do get some false positives. It's a very small rate. It's a controllable one. It does get close to zero, but never quite zero. And you can think of it this way. Every time an element gets added in the bloom filter, we don't really store the entire element. We store a representation of it. I like to think of it as storing the shadow of the element. We kind of can make up what the element is, but, we, but it's not the full element in full, vivid, multicolor self. We store the shadow. And as we keep adding elements here, we kind of can recognize different shapes made out of the, sh the shadows of these elements. And we might even say, oh, look, I see a cat over there. And that would be the analogy of our false positives made out of different elements. But if I say, 
I definitely don't see an element anywhere here, then we can be absolutely sure there are no elephants in our bloom filter. And I would like to just take a moment to appreciate how deliciously well this analogy sits with the, the mysterious Mr. Bloom shadows. Okay, well, a data structure that does give, uh, give us some good results and some tr results that we cannot really trust. How usable is this? Can we make that work? A bicycle with one, uh, one wheel. We actually can. There are some really common use cases out there. The original use case is for spell checkers. That's what bloom filters were initially used for. Basically, as you're writing the text, you're checking every word that you're writing against the bloom filter. If you get a negative result, that means the, the, that word is not present in your dictionary, that will definitely mean that that word is misspelled. Very similarly, blocked IP addresses, you maintain a list of block IP addresses, you check against it. If it's not there, that address is definitely good. Bad word filters also very similar. User registration, is, there, is this email or username already taken? Recommendation engines, have I seen this item yet? Uh, forbidden or weak passwords, IP trace back extensively used in networks. Uh, have I seen this package as a, uh, a router, as a network router? To generalize all kinds of questions where the answer no is valuable. So how does this work? Let's open it up and break it apart. On the data layer, a bloom filter is simply a bit array. Every time we want to add an element, we run it through a hash function, and then we modulo divide by the number of elements in our bit array. Going back to our previous analogy, we can think of this two-step process as um, converting our image to a silhouette and making it a little bit transparent for the people who like analogies. And then the result will give us the position of the bit we want to flip to one. Next element, same process, position number one, we flip the bit at position number one. Element three, we get a hash collision. So the third element, uh, the third element's representation will also be at bit number one. And this is how those false positives occur. Okay, so what can we do uh, to diminish, to lower the probability of false positives? Well, we can use a bigger array. We can use and should use a good uniform hashing function. Should be very fast also. Uniform in this uh, case means that the results will be evenly distributed along the whole bit array, not just stuff every, stuffing everything in the middle. And we could use more hashing function. Instead of representing one element with one bit, we can represent it with three, thus lowering the, the chance of collision. So let's see how would that work in this case. We have element one, same process, hashing function. The first hashing function will flip bit at position 11. Say second will flip bit at position eight. And third, position five. Now these three bits are a more granular representation of the element one. Instead we had one bit, now we have three. Second element, <coughs> position number 13, and as you can see now, we do get a hash collision here on position number eight. But you will see in the end that the representation of the two elements is actually not going to be the same because they are represented by three elements each. If we wanted to have a full collision, all three bits would have to, uh, to clash. Okay, so how do we check for presence? How do we check if that element is in the set? That's what bloom filters do, uh, do after all. That's their uh, man, main task. Element X, we do the exact same process. We get the, uh, the uh, bit positions we want to check. And we then just check uh, if the bits in our bit array on those positions have been flipped. If at least one of the bits is zero, then we can be sure 
that that element has never been added to the bloom array. And those are our guaranteed negatives. Definitely not present. If we get uh, bits, if we get the positions on bits that have, have been flipped, then we can say that that element might be present in the set with a certain certainty. And what is that, uh, what is that error rate? What can we, what can we expect? Well, a Bloom filter has four main characteristics. M is the number of bits in the filter, so the length of our bit array, okay? K is the number of hash functions we are going to use. N is the number of items that are in the filter. And P is the uh, calculated probability of false positives. And this is the formula you can, you can use to uh, calculate, if you know three of the variables, to calculate uh, the fourth. You can play around with them knowing one thing, you can derive the other. And uh, usually, you will see in a moment how, how you should choose your variables. Let's go to Redis Bloom. Redis Bloom is a module developed by Redis Labs uh, implementing Bloom filters and uh, we'll mention also a few other uh, probabilistic data structures uh, in the end. In Redis Bloom, the number of K is fixed, sorry, to two. So we have K, uh, so we, uh, the number of hash functions is two and the hash function is murmur. The outcome of the first function is used as the seed for the second function. And then, when you create a Bloom filter, it will ask you, unless you want to go with the default version that uses uh, N of 100, if I'm not mistaken, and um, P of 0 0.01, unless you want to go with that, which is a very, very small Bloom filter, please don't choose that. Um, you choose, you specify N, the number of items you want to put, you expect to have in the filter in the end, and the probability you want, so the rate of false positives you can accept working with. And this is the point to stress how important it is to choose this properly, because once you set your filter, it cannot grow. If you ever fill up your filter, you will have to put another one on top of it, a bigger one, and you start adding new elements there. And every time you want to check for presence, you will check both of them, which of course uh, adds latency. So how I like to think, uh, by the way, Redis does, provide, uh, does do this automatically. So if you fill up your filter, Redis will always try to maintain the, uh, Redis Bloom, sorry, will always try to maintain the probability you chose by stacking filters on top of each other. So how I try to visualize this, I have quite a visual memory, is if you start adding too many elements in this, this just becomes a black blob and after a while you don't really, uh, you can't really make out anything of this. You will just start getting false positives for everything. Do you see any shape? Yeah, you can find any shape in a full <laughs> black image. Okay, the commands, I don't know why this is broken. This is the PowerPoint, sorry, the PowerPoint conversion. Um, the commands look like this. When you want, very, very simple, very intuitive. When you want to reserve a filter, you specify, you go BF, reserve, you specify the key name, the name of the Bloom filter, the error rate and the capacity. Every time you want to add an element, it's BF add, name of the key, uh, value. Every, every time you want to check, BF exists, name of the key, um, and uh, value. And that's about it. That's all you need to start uh, using uh, Redis, um, to use uh, the Bloom filter in Redis Bloom. Now, the Redis Bloom has uh, some more, some more data, probabilistic data structures implemented. Uh, one of them bears the name of a, of a cuckoo bird. Do you know what the cuckoo bird is famous for? It's a brood parasite. It lays eggs in other birds' nests and then the little birds kick the other eggs out of the nest. They're terrible. The, uh, the female bird even imitates uh, predator's bird's uh, uh, cry 
to make the other bird go away so they can go in the nest and put an egg there. They're, they're really, they're terrible <laughs> birds. And um, this filter takes this name because what, it uses two bit array. I'm not going to go in detail on this one. Uh, I would like to focus more on the next one, but it just kicks elements out, if, uh, out in different arrays. And I just thought it was funny to, to mention that. If you want to read about the implementation, I really recommend using, uh, reading the original paper. It's, it's actually relatively easy to read and easy to understand, and it's, it's just cool to know. Um, count means catch, and this is the last one we are going to focus on. Uh, it is used to uh, to count frequency of an object, of an element, in streams. So if you just care about uh, the frequency you, you, and you don't need to, you, can, you, don't, you can't afford to store all elements and just uh, use counters for everything, you can use the fixed memory space like this, very similar to our bit array, but now every hash function has its own bit array. And instead of flipping bits from, uh, sorry, uh, it's on array, it's not a bit array now. Instead of flipping bits from zero to one, we store a counter of how many times uh, we've seen that element. So, for example, if we have element one and we, we get uh, results two, zero, and three out of our hashing and then modulo dividing, we go to the row H1 to position two. I had updated this actually. I don't, this is an older version. You set the counter at position two uh, to one. Same thing for zero and so on. And then for the next element, you start increasing. So as you can see from the third hash function, we got the element three again. And that means that in the uh, H3 row, three column, we now increase. We have seen that uh, something, uh, um, uh, we have seen that element, a part of that element, twice. And then, let's say we added more elements and then our um, table looks like this. When we want to check for frequency, we take an element, we run it through the three hash functions, we get the positions, two, four, and uh, three, and then out of these three, we just take the minimum. And that's, um, that's what we are going to agree on, is, is that is the minimum frequency of that element. Of course, the, it might be higher, sorry, yeah, no, uh, yeah, it might be lower, this overcounts a little bit, but it never undercounts. And with that, I would just like to uh, stress out how good and how useful probabilistic data structures can be. They are cool to work with, they save you a lot of space, um, they are very efficient, and I consider them as tools you can, you can add to your developer's toolbox. If you have more of them, you won't ev use everything as a hammer. Thank you.